In 2001, Weezer's bassist disappeared. Frontman Rivers Cuomo had asked Mikey Welsh to join the band all the way back in 1998, after their last album flopped and their founding bassist quit. But Welsh would have to wait. It wouldn't be for another three years that Cuomo would work up the courage to actually release a follow-up, the smash hit Green Album. But halfway through the project's promotional cycle, Mikey was nowhere to be found. A nervous breakdown and a stint at a mental hospital kept him from even contacting his bandmates. And when he recovered, Welsh found that Weezer was much less patient than he was. All I know is that one week I had these guys in my band that were like my best friends and 15 different people at our record label who thought they were my best friend, publicists and assistants, and the next week I was in the hospital and that was it. I was all alone. End of story. The whole thing with Rivers and I, I think it's really complicated and it's wrapped up in a lot of emotion. All I can really say about that guy is that he doesn't do well with big success. He and I were very, very close. We were like brothers, and I don't know. He's able to completely shut down like a block of ice. All I can say really is that if I told you exactly what happened with me and how I left the band and you printed it, he'd probably try and sue me. Because if our fans knew the truth of what happened, I don't think they'd like him very much. Rivers Cuomo was getting bold. You can tell because of the beard. For the first time ever, something had gone exactly according to his plan. 1994 was too big. 1996 was too small. But 2001 was just right. Hashpipe was on every rock station in the country. The Green Album was flying off the shelves. And a whole new generation of young fans were selling kidneys for concert tickets. Not always their own. On top of it all was our lad, the Puppet Master. After spending much of the 90s butting heads with his bandmates over control of the band, he made their third album his way, and he suddenly felt all the more certain that Weezer thrived under his unconditional leadership. So much so that he had evolved past arguing with his band and started arguing with his bosses. First of which being Weezer's manager, Pat Magnarella. He'd gotten in the band's good graces in the wake of the Black Room, a year-long period after Pinkerton's failure when Rivers disconnected his phone and painted his walls and windows black to try and perfect pop music. As you do. Magnarella served as their only form of communication after Cuomo emerged from the shadows in the year 2000 and secured Weezer a last-minute spot on the band's Warp Tour when they were ready for a comeback. But more recently, with confidence no longer an issue, Pat had grown into a real bother, so Rivers fired him in June of 2001. It was a chaotic move, as the band were on tour at the time, but the media didn't really notice until a lawsuit popped up in September, leading many publications to learn that Rivers himself had taken on the role of band manager since then. It's way less stressful. When I want to do something, I do it. When I don't, I don't. I don't have to deal with somebody whispering in my ear, you ought to do this because the record company will be happy. I don't have anybody telling me what to do. I don't feel like I have to deal with anything I don't want to do now, and I don't really do anything I don't want to do. I don't even really feel comfortable saying I manage the band. Basically, we're unmanaged. What I've done is just cut the industry off from access to us. We're in our own little bubble here. That's my management philosophy. Leave us alone. Like I said, it was getting pretty bold. And with that lawsuit being tossed out fairly quickly, his ego wasn't shrinking, inspiring a decision that would come to define the band's next album. Despite the nearly three-year-long gap between the production of Blue and its follow-up and the five-year gap between Pinkerton and its follow-up, work on the band's fourth album started just days after the release of their third. Hell, Rivers later told Request that he had half of the next album written before Green even came out. His work in the Black Room had helped him turn songwriting into a science, and these days he was literally writing a new demo every week. That, mixed with a more consistent rehearsal schedule, meant the music was flowing, and the band was itching to have it heard. Why should I wait two years for a typical album cycle to end so we can put out another one? We're just kind of doing what we want to do. Even after Weezer lost track of their latest bassist, Mikey Welsh, in August of 2001, they simply hired a replacement, Scott Schreiner. A long-time gigging musician in the Los Angeles area, Schreiner was a fair bit older than the Weezers and not quite as nerdy, but that didn't stop him from gelling with the boys almost immediately, proving that much of the tension behind Weezer's fourth album wouldn't come from inside the studio. The truth is, production on the Green Album didn't go totally according to plan. 
Artists typically complain about heavy record label meddling on their first few projects before they've really proven themselves. By 2001, you'd expect the execs over at Geffen Records to have a little more faith in the boys. But coming five years after a sophomore slump and two years after a catastrophic merger that saw most of the label gutted, the corporate overlords weren't feeling too trusting. They stopped the band from starting production in October of 2000, sent several demands mid-development, and pushed the project in an overall sterile direction. With guitarist Brian Bell later admitting, we had to have a hit album or we would be in danger of being dropped by our record label. This was enough to sour the band's relationship with Geffen already, but their cancelling of a European tour in October of 2001 and complete fumbling of a possible performance on the late show with David Letterman crossed a line. The label was already starting to send notes about the heavier direction of the band's new demos when Rivers cut them off completely, instead paying for the new album's mixing and studio time out of pocket and not even telling the oligarchs what they were doing until they finished. Now is the point where I have to state the obvious. This is not common. This is not something that mainstream artists on major labels typically do, but that's not to say they wouldn't like to. Nobody likes feeling powerless, and the band didn't even want to work with a producer. We don't really look for help unless someone is forcing us. We're together all the time. We're always playing music. We're always on stage. We're always in the studio or we're rehearsing. And we don't feel like, oh, we're going to make an album now. Let's go bring in this totally different person out of our normal routine. That just doesn't make sense to us. This is what we do. Just press record. That's how we make an album. This level of control felt liberating at first, but it soon became suffocating. The over 100 songs Cuomo had written before Green had just about tripled by the end of 2001, and when Weezer headed to the studio to record their fourth album, just six months after the release of their third, the band had literally hundreds of songs to choose from. This meant pre-production was kind of a mess. We had a song drought for the longest time, now we have like a song glut. With no producer to help whittle down the choices, the band had to find another influential voice. Or a couple thousand. Weezer had always held a closer relationship with their fans than any other popular band. Even back when they weren't popular, they were on a first-name basis with most of them. Michael and Carly would start the Weezer fan club, and Carl Cook would start Weezer.com, the internet's one-stop shop for band news, history, contests, and media. Ultimately reaching a point where committed followers could find out exactly what the band were doing every single day. Eventually, though, a line was crossed between knowledge and influence. Surveys started appearing online where fans could vote on what producers they'd like to work on Green and what bands they'd like to see tour with Weezer. Soon, Rivers himself made an account on the AOL Instant Messenger and started conversing with fans personally. It was literally unheard of in mainstream music. But of course, over time, some listeners got a little overzealous. They started bringing their complaints straight to the source, telling Cuomo which of the leaked demos they'd like to see on an album and what songs needed to be tweaked. You'd think the famously stiff frontman would have recoiled at such honesty, but he didn't. He actually appreciated it. Three more songs. What will they be? We go together. Slob the Dawn. Slob the Dawn. We go together. But extend the solo on Slob, like the Spaceland version. Where can I hear the Spaceland version? Weezon video section. Oof. Oof. Reintro too long. Oof. Oof. No bridge, people. This needs work. Nice toot, though. A toot on Slob? Yeah, structural hellhole. Structural bliss. To each their own. Rivers would later admit that Slob wouldn't have made it on the album if not for popular demand. And as unorthodox as this sounds, it's really not all that different from working with a producer. Cuomo would even start posting some of the newer songs they were recording on the official Weezer website, allowing fans to hear exactly what was supposed to be on the new album and give notes as needed. It was a completely grassroots project. Communications weren't always civil, though. Not long after Pinkerton bombed in 1996, it grew a cult following among young hormonal listeners, impressed by its brutally honest lyrics and experimental composition. Some of these fans would grow into the pioneers of third wave emo, with Weezer sometimes being misidentified as an emo band for this reason. However, these same fans would find no enjoyment in Pinkerton's clinical follow-up. With purposely vague repetitive lyrics and simplistic repetitive song structure, Green may have been perfect for the radio, but not for the diehard fans, the very people who would be reaching out to Rivers online. One famous confrontation came when a fan popped into a message board to trash the newer Weezer songs and praise his deeply personal prized favorite, Only in Dreams only for Rivers himself to crash the party and insult his own creation. 
admit it. Still, it can't be overstated how influential the fanbase was on the production of Weezer's fourth album, even eventually choosing the project's name, Maladroit, inspiring Rivers to correct interviewers who called it a self-produced album. If anything, it should say, produced by the message board fans. They were listening to the demos every night and posting their criticisms. We would take those into the studio the next day. Most of the feedback was really mean and unjustified, but even that is good. That's what producers do sometimes. They just say really mean things to get you all pissed off. I really think it helped. With the track list slowly paring itself down over time and absolutely no label interference, production on Maladroit had become a total breeze, allowing Rivers to dedicate some effort towards evolving the sound of Weezer. The most obvious place this can be heard is on the album's harsher tone and many, many, many guitar solos. Of course, Weezer had always had some soloing, especially on their first two albums, but Green was really lacking in that realm. I think that after you've made a record that's pretty straight pop stuff, you kind of just want to bust loose on the guitar a little bit. It's just something you feel in your bones. I opened up my playing during the writing process, and this is where we ended up. The greatest difference between the sound of Green and Maladroit would be that looseness. But outside of the studio, things were much more tense. The truth is, I barely scratched the surface on how far Rivers took this whole manager thing. He quickly assumed control of the band's touring schedule, merchandise, interviews, TV spots, and as we've seen, album release strategy recording and posting songs online without label permission, and now sending Maladroit sampler CDs to radio stations nationwide, basically telling them to play whichever song they liked the most. This strange course of action actually paid off at first, with Dope Nose quickly working its way into heavy rotation and almost accidentally becoming Maladroit's first single. But for Geffen, it was the last straw, as they'd soon let Rivers know that, unfortunately, they have the right to claim ownership of the tapes. It's totally unfair. Yeah, regardless of how little involvement the band's record label had in it thus far, they still legally owned Maladroit. Meaning that if Weezer wanted it released, there would have to be some serious concessions. In mid-February of 2002, the audiovisual page on Weezer's website was taken down, meaning no more band demos could be downloaded officially. Then, on the 28th, Rivers was forced to write a letter to every radio station in the country that was playing Dope Nose and asked them to stop until Geffen said so. Just embarrassing, really, and immature from the label's perspective. Thankfully, most radio stations ignored River's plea and continued to play Dope Nose so regularly that it broke into the top 20 on the modern rock chart. That, mixed with those two acts of good faith from the band, were enough to get them back on the label's good side, and by early April, Carl Cook was able to report three pieces of good news to the Weezer website all at once. First of all, they got a firm release date for Maladroit, and May 14, it is almost exactly a year to the date from the release of Green. The second cool thing is that Weezer has won back and secured the right to continue to post MP3s of their new demos. The third equally cool thing is that Weezer has secured a February 2003 release time for their fifth album, currently in production. Fun fact. Before the release of Weezer's Green Album, the band was having quite a bit of trouble whittling down the 20 songs they had recorded with producer Rick Okasik, and there was a period when the number of songs on the track list was constantly fluctuating. 16, 11, 14, 12, but there was one number that Geffen would not allow. 13, because it was bad luck. I'm sure that this was in the back of the band's mind somewhere when they chose the final track list on Maladroit. American Gigolo, Dope Nose, Keep Fishin', Take Control, Death and Destruction, Slob, Burnt Jam, Space Rock, Slave, Fall Together, Possibilities, Love Explosion, and December. Overall, a much more diverse and sonically dense lot than Green, but still, you know, in spite of this, expectations were high before Maladroid's May 14, 2002 release date. Weezer had proven with their last release that the Blue Album was the rule, not the exception, that they could stay relevant while reaching all new heights. And it looked like they'd done it again. Maladroid was met with the best reviews at release of any Weezer album since Blue. Of course, it's sort of hard to track that metric with how many old reviews are lost and how flattering more modern reviews tend to be, but you catch my meaning. The critics liked it. Commercially, Maladroit performed similarly, debuting at number 3 on Billboard's Top 200, one spot above its predecessor, and higher than any other Weezer album had ever been on the list. That, mixed with a gold record arriving in the mail exactly a month later, seemed to prove that Weezer's unconventional methods had paid off. For a while. 
The first red flag sprung up when the album's first single started faltering in June. After garnering enough radio play to help convince the label to release Maladroit and reaching a peak position of number 8 on Billboard's modern rock chart, Dope Nose was already being phased out by many major radio stations, just a few weeks after the release of the album it was meant to promote. This was bound to happen eventually, which is why Weezer remixed another song off the album to serve as Maladroit's second single, Keep Fishing. There were high hopes that the more whimsical, green album-esque ditty could replace Dope Nose as a steady player on the radio, and while it did slowly work its way up the modern rock charts, Keep Fishing was proving not to be the band's next island in the sun. So all hope for Maladroit's success was instead placed on the band's next music video, a Hail Mary. They pulled out all the stops, shaved River's beard, and put together Weezer's biggest production since Buddy Holly. Keep Fishin's music video centered around Weezer as musical guests on The Muppet Show, featuring, you guessed it, The Muppets. And contrasting the chaos found in the video itself, the shoot went swimmingly, with Pat later denying rumors that he had engaged in an affair with his co-star and Kermit the Frog commenting, Weezer fit right in. They're rock stars. They're used to being around animals, bears, and egotistical pigs. While today the video is remembered as one of Weezer's best in 2002, it did little to move the needle. The band would continue to promote Maladroit Live with a national, European, and of course Japanese tour earlier in the year, but they'd cut even that short in August. By then, the writing was on the wall. Maladroit stalled out at just over three quarters of a million sales, and to this day has yet to reach platinum status, leading many to ask, why? Unfortunately, most of them didn't ask publicly, so I'm just gonna have to assume why. While at first, band members like Pat Wilson would call it the best thing that Weezer ever did, Rivers turned to manager may have been anything but. Sure, it was rewarding for his ego and comfortable for the band, but you can't deny that not really doing anything we don't want to do could have restricted some opportunities for promoting the album. It's hard to say exactly what they skipped out on since nobody went through the effort of documenting everything Weezer didn't do in 2002, but considering everything the band did do in 2000 and 2001, this year was pretty muted in comparison. It also can't be denied that the album sort of had an original sin, being recorded and released less than a year after its predecessor. Rivers would publicly doubt the need for a two-year waiting period between albums, but bands do it for good reason. That time allows for more touring, more rehearsal, more work in the studio, more marketing, more change, and ultimately, more hype. Hype was everything Weezer had in 2001. It was the very foundation that Green was built on. Seven years after their smash hit and five after their weird flop, Rivers Cuomo came back with braces and hash pipe, leading the whole world to scratch their head and investigate with their wallets. There was no need for that on Maladroit. Half of the album's songs were on Weezer's own website, later on Napster, and its first single had been in heavy radio rotation for three months before release. Every single one of these decisions was made by none other than Weezer's own Golden Boy, and by assuming all the responsibility, Cuomo also assumed all the blame, just adding to the bad reputation that he had been cultivating for the past few years. As Ben Mitchell would write for Kerrang!, Rivers Cuomo is behaving like a spoiled brat. In his article, he'd go on to detail that Rivers had, without warning, decided to skip that morning's photo shoot, leaving his embarrassed assistant to apologize for him. Apparently, Cuomo had a falling out with one of the band's publicists, refusing to occupy the same room as him. A few hours later, Ben was speaking to the rest of the band on their tour bus when a call finally came through from Rivers himself, explaining that he'd be perfectly willing to engage with the rest of that day's plans if the offending publicist was kicked off the bus that instant. No detours. When Cuomo did finally make time for an interview, Mitchell foregoed all the typical pleasantries and went straight for the throat. Why did you pull that little rock star trip today? There's incidents like that all the time. I think you've been childish. A bit toys out of the pram. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I, I think so. Well, I, I try to give myself complete license to do whatever I want at any time, regardless of how it affects other people. And I think the benefits I gain artistically from living like that outweigh the costs of, um, all the problems that I have with society. Meaning? Everyone hating me. What kind of person does that make you? Selfish. Immature. And you are right with that? Yeah. I tried all different kinds of ways of living, and I've discovered that this is the most conducive to creativity. Acting on whim, regardless of consequences. With no consideration for other people? No. Occasionally I'll have pangs of conscience, but I try to overcome them. To me, that's a small price to pay. The interviewer would later admit to being caught off guard by Rivers' honesty, calmness, even charisma in the way that he spoke about these things, leading the rest of the interview to progress somewhat normally. 
aside from the now infamous comment that Pinkerton is a shit album and the bizarre mention of an 18-year-old e-girlfriend. Until the very end of the conversation. When asked if Weezer could continue if everyone but him left, Cuomo replied, Definitely. Definitely. Going on to insist that this does not cause problems. Indeed, it helps things to run smoothly. Ben asked if that meant he was in charge. Yeah, I'm the boss, and there's a very clear hierarchy. We all know our place. So the interviewer read Rivers' comments right back to the band and gauged their response. Is that what he said? That's probably true. It is his band, man. I don't think that's a strange comment. Good for him. Good for him. It definitely would not sound the same if he left. It could sound great in a different way. Nothing's going to stop the show for him, and, and that's part of the reason why I got in here. It's a survival thing, really. Scott would later denounce this interview to Weezer.com, explaining that he was very happy to be in the band, and that any aggression expressed in the interview was meant to be directed at the prying interviewer, not Rivers. And while that helped prove that everyone in the band really was loyal to their leader at this point, it did nothing to soften Cuomo's own negative words and awful attitude. The same energy he'd bring to really every interview, as his old antisocial personality from the 90s came back with an intentionally bitter twist. Somewhere along the way, Rivers had convinced himself that he needed to be an asshole for Weezer to be popular. But in 2002, he was the biggest jerk he'd ever been, and Maladroit still flopped. With another album scheduled for release just nine months later, he was left with two choices. Barrel on forward and hope album four was just a fluke, or steer the ship into unknown waters. To be honest, I thought it was a prank. In the spring of 2004, Mikey Welsh was at home playing with his dog, when his wife handed him a letter postmarked Hollywood, California. At first, Welsh admits he couldn't believe what was inside, but as he read it and reread it, he started hearing the words written on the paper in the voice of the man who had apparently written it, Rivers Cuomo. And it was saying things he'd never thought he'd hear from the Weezer frontman. An apology. When asked on AOL Instant Messenger to describe the sound of Weezer's fifth album, Rivers Cuomo called it a combo of green and pink, if that's possible. And the reason why he expressed some doubt is the same reason you probably are. The Green Album was specifically designed to be as different from Pink as possible. So how could there possibly be any middle ground there? Well, it's not that far-fetched. While Weezer's third album went to great lengths to keep the vibes purely positive, their fourth, Maladroit, let quite a bit of angst slip through the door, even allowing for some great murky instrumentals and variety in River's vocals. The missing ingredient really only being those personal lyrics. And while it had been a while since Cuomo had allowed himself to really dig deep into his psyche, he had plenty of confidence at this point in his abilities. Even still, he clarified in a second AIM message that it may very well change before we get there, though, leaving with a final note that they'd be demoing soon before signing off on January 8th, 2002. Yeah, sorry for the spoiler. Initially, pre-production on album 5 went pretty well. I guess. Really, a term like pre-production barely applies here. After Scott Schreiner joined the band in August of 2001, Weezer quickly fell into a consistent routine. Tour for a few weeks, record for a few weeks, tour for a few weeks, record for a few weeks. It wasn't the 90s anymore. Sure, studio time still cost money, but it wasn't like they were starving artists. All the band did, really, was rehearse the songs Rivers wrote every week and eventually press record. That's why they didn't bother hiring a producer on Maladroit. Who needs some geezer pressing the record button for you and telling you it sounds bad? When they were ready to transition from demoing to proper professional recording, they just hired an engineer to make it all sound pretty. We'll be in the studio till the end of time. Either we're going to tour or be in the studio recording. That's all there is to it. The idea was to apply that same routine to the band's next album. After that year's first American tour, they cut 13 demos at a local LA studio in March. Then, after a European tour, they picked up where they left off in April. That's when an interviewer from Rockpile stopped by the band's recording space and noted their professionalism, the stunning lack of beer bottles, and the confidence of their leader. Meanwhile, the singer has given the official OK on this last song. It clocks in at a meaty 2 minutes and 26 seconds, notes Chad, the band's engineer, from behind the mixing board. That's an opus magnum, laughs Cuomo, clearly enjoying every minute of this. And why shouldn't he? The three-minute pop song is overrated anyway. But just two months later, something had clearly changed. 
While the band kept up their typical routine of touring and rehearsing, they gave Carl Cook an interesting bit of information. One thing the guys are keeping in mind is that they will likely be using a producer this time out. So, I guess you really do need a geezer sometimes. It's not quite clear what exactly inspired this change of heart outside of the recent release of the band's second failed self-produced album, but the truth is Rivers was already interested in taking the project in a different direction. The real question now was, what direction? He explained to some fans in January of 2002 that he was experimenting with personal lyrics again, inspired by some girl. But in April, he told Kerrang! that he was moving away from love songs. A month later, he doubled down on the personal lyrics point to Guitar World, but a month after that, Rolling Stone quoted him gushing about Limp Bizkit and rap metal, explaining that, I really see us moving in that direction. Oh god, that would have been so funny! Why did he do that? <clears throat> Sorry, I lost myself. Regardless, it wouldn't be until September of 2002, after the last of the band's shows promoting Maladroit wrapped up, that more serious rehearsals took place at SIR Studios, and their choice of producer finally started leaking. I have been hearing rumors that Rick Rubin may produce Album 5. I can neither confirm nor deny these rumors, which should tell you a lot. <laughs> it doesn't. While it is true that Rick Rubin did at some point sign on to produce Album 5, I'm not entirely sure when, and his role in the production would be fairly hands-off. On again, off again, as Rolling Stone would put it. This is not unheard of, by the way. While on some projects a producer can be as much of a creative force as the artist themselves, on others, not so much. And Rick Rubin has gotten a lot of flack in recent years for allegedly falling on the not so much end of the spectrum. Especially after telling 60 Minutes, I have no technical ability and I know nothing about music. Instead, his role is that of an experienced, confident voice. A guru, if you will, which fits with his overall persona. Despite being best known at this point for working with bands like the Beastie Boys and co-founding Def Jam Records, Rubin was a very spiritual man, which is where his influence on Weezer really shone through. Rivers didn't believe in the music, because he didn't believe in himself. Didn't matter how many times we said, that's rad, dude, there were times he was physically ill coming out of the studio. Yes, the time has finally come. It was bound to happen. Rivers' year-long streak of unshakable confidence was wavering, and while many of these negative feelings were brought on by a genuine displeasure with the direction of the album, most of them came from his personal life, or a lack thereof. I feel that Weezer is more my own name than my own name is. I identify with it so completely. Rivers had already explained to many outlets around this time that although he'd never exactly been Joe popular, in more recent years he had shed his social life entirely replacing it with songwriting, recording, touring, and managing two bands, Cuomo's own and that of his former high school bandmate, Kevin Rydell. Though, as he'd continue explaining to Filter, he'd made a few exceptions. I don't like meeting new people, he says when I ask him if he ever gets used to spending time with strangers like myself. I have a ton of friends. I have a thousand relationships over the internet. So it's like, I don't need any more people in my life. There's enough. He admits to spending all day, every day, maneuvering himself through chat rooms and talking to fans who are very aware of whom they're chatting with. It's a process of connecting with his public that Rivers takes very seriously. They're my best friends, he says, with no hint of insincerity. From there, the interview continued as normal, or as normal as you'd expect, until a familiar chime interrupted Filter and brought Rivers quickly rolling back to his laptop. Here's one of my internet friends. His name is DJ Funks. I asked him if he'd like to say something to Filter Magazine. He said, Weezer is still better than most of the bands out there, but I await the old Weezer's return. That's a very common sentiment amongst these freaks. Freaks? The interviewer asked. I thought these were your best friends. Oh, we have a very tempestuous relationship. We're constantly criticizing each other. All right, well, as charming and quirky as this may have seemed in 2002, what with the semi-famous rock star mingling so closely with his semi-adoring fan base, I'd use a different word to describe this scenario these days. Parasocial. Weezer were among the first bands to take full advantage of the internet as a means of marketing and fan outreach. Some of the first celebrities, really. The web was an uncharted, often underestimated place, so it makes sense that America's nerdiest band was also the quickest to understand it. But as easily as this new tool could raise someone to tremendous heights, it could also damn them to unprecedented lows. Which is why in recent years, net-centric celebrities have been very careful to keep a strong boundary between them and their audience. Unfortunately, Rivers was a pioneer. 
So he had to learn the hard way. Like Elvis. A few weeks after that filter interview, Cuomo told Spin that he'd cut ties with his internet friends, explaining that things got totally out of control and the mob was rising up. Explaining, I'm gonna be rapping a lot more, by the way. I think that was the main cause of the falling out between me and my internet audience. Damn it! It's not fair! Why did he just do it? Sorry. It's just... It, it would have changed everything. Without the Weezer army keeping him warm at night, Rivers sought comfort elsewhere, allowing himself to fall completely into a life of ego and vice, which mostly meant sleeping with a lot of Asian girls. Unfortunately, no amount of sin could fill that vacant spot in his heart. Which brings us back to The Guru. It was February of 2003, the same month that was meant to be Album 5's release date and Rivers' lowest point. So Rick Rubin reached out and gifted him The Gift. No, I'm not being vague. <laughs> Written by 14th century poet Hafiz, The Gift is a book of ghazals, or love songs. But contrary to what you're thinking, most of these songs were tied less to a love of women and more to a love of God. This was a real sticking point for Rivers, who was born to Buddhist parents and grew up in an ashram, but had since decided he was an atheist. I now read these spiritual teachings as coded instructions for how to connect with my musical creativity. For example, when Hafiz says, self-effacement is the emerald dagger you need to plunge deep into yourself upon this path to God, I read it as, self-effacement is the emerald dagger you need to plunge deep into yourself upon this path to musical creativity. With the book, Ruben also gave a mild suggestion, meditation, which Cuomo would vehemently reject. Again, he'd spent much of his childhood meditating daily, but Rivers felt that he'd outgrown all that, that he relied on the confusion and angst that defined much of his life. I think the only way for me to write songs is to be unhappy. If he slowed down, reflected, reconsidered, it would all fall apart. To which Rick responded, okay. Aw, oh, damn it. So Rivers attended a Tibetan meditation retreat. And while it was a good start, as Ruben would later note, whatever Rivers is interested in, he dives in a thousand percent. He takes things to radical extremes, leading him to explore Vipassana, an intense form of meditation which commands 12 hours of utter silence every day for 10 days, until the last few minutes. At the very end of it, the teacher leads this guided meditation, which is called Metta, where you say over and over again these positive statements in your mind. This is at the end of 10 days of just brutal, ruthless self-confrontation. One of the things he said was, I pardon all those who have harmed me in action, speech, or thought. And then he says, I seek pardon from all those who I have hurt in action, speech, or thought. After 10 days of working so hard at that course, I had so much pent up emotion that I started crying. And I was feeling so sorry for being so self-centered in my life. Rivers kept up the Vipassana as he explored the writings of Hafiz, Rumi, Kabir, Eckhart Tolle, and Lao Tzu. Inspired, he decided to stage a sort of hard reset on his life, reaching out to his old friend and current client, Kevin Rydell, with an offer to trade. Everything. Kevin would get the mansion, and Rivers would get his Honda. The plans fell through, however, when it was discovered that Rydell's apartment couldn't support broadband internet, and Cuomo took a different path. He quit his day job as a double band manager, sold everything he owned, started volunteering at Project Angel Food six days a week, and moved into a small apartment next door to Rick Rubin. I'm often associated, or in some cases blamed, for River's meditation practice. It worked for him. You might see him smile or laugh now. And before, you would never see that. Although production slowed to a crawl in the early months of 2003, the album's producer would continue to influence the band, though still on a much more personal level than musical. Despite the very positive vibes that Weezer would portray publicly for the past few years, it would seem that Rivers' mini-dictatorship wasn't always a benevolent one. Mikey Welsh would tell the press a lot of crazy stuff that he then asked to be stricken from the record for fear of being sued, but he did let some details slip, like how Pat and Brian had grown more apathetic than anything, while Rivers had taken to punishing his bandmates for their mistakes. Like after one show when Bell's guitar was out of tune, and Cuomo allegedly fined him $2,000.
It's unclear if the band's relationship stayed this bad through the production of Maladroit and early work on album 5. Some quotes from Pat Wilson and Scott Triner imply otherwise, but the situation was rough enough that Rick would call Weezer the most dysfunctional band he'd ever worked with, and suggest that they see a communication coach. The dude literally told them to get professional help. Rivers has had a shift. I don't think it's any secret he's been into Vipassana, and that seems to have only been a benefit. We would actually have band meetings that would last hours, and we'd go over all years of this crap and put it out on the table, and be able to deal with it and handle it. It seemed that Brian, the one guy who didn't shit-talk Rivers in the 90s, had now grown the most frustrated with him. So, after a few sessions with the couple's counselor, Rivers extended an olive branch to the guitarist and formally apologized for his behavior. It didn't fix everything, but it was cathartic for the both of them, inspiring Cuomo to repeat the gesture and make amends with nearly 30 other former friends throughout the next few months. That's a lot of pissed off people. The most confrontational of these would be Mikey Welsh, who after receiving that initial apology letter from Cuomo in 2004, sat down with his former friend and had an hours long conversation about where it all went wrong. I think it shocked him how he had been and how he had treated people. You can't treat people like that. You can't just start f***ing with people because you feel like it. By 2005, Welsh still clearly held some resentment for the frontman, but nonetheless called him a fascist, a genius, and a friend. Cuomo's great spiritual awakening would further influence his life at the end of 2004, when he re-enrolled in Harvard University at the ripe old age of 34 but he'd always been one of the older students at the school. After attending community college in his free time during Weezer's early years, Rivers applied to the East Coast premier Ivy League school as an escape from his uncomfortable West Coast lifestyle. He came in search of the simple life, but a quick traumatic leg extension before his first semester grew into a year-long burden that tarnished his time in Massachusetts. By the time he flew home to record Weezer's second album, it had grown into, well, Pinkerton. Not the kind of project a simple happy man makes, and after it failed, he dropped out of college to dedicate himself completely to Weezer. But that decision was never meant to be final, even as early as 1999 during the Black Room era. And only a year after leaving the school, he had, <laughs> he had tried signing up for another semester, only to learn that he had missed the registration deadline by just two weeks. Disappointed, he instead chose to write a hit album and treat his friends bad, but now, why not? He was only two semesters away from graduation, and as he joked to the Boston Globe, he'd be more than willing to go if a girl goes there that I know. <laughs> Always the romantic. Is now a good time to mention he was celibate? Rivers' love life has always been a complicated facet of the Weezer story. The only girlfriend of his that most fans know is Jennifer Chiba, who he dated on and off in the 90s and inspired much of Pinkerton. But post-Pinkerton, and again post-Maladroit, Rivers would dip his toes in the proper rock star lifestyle, sleeping with dozens of groupies and ultimately triggering some deep, deep shame. All of this is to say, he'd had some bad luck romantically, and never really learned the lessons that a man in his 30s should have learned by now. But that was going to change. Rivers was finally trying to grow as a person, and that meant taking a vow. No more sex until marriage. Commitment like that, either to celibacy or to one person, helps your mind calm down and get over the excitement that constantly comes with finding someone new and then breaking up. I was actually really obsessing about it until I did that last 20-day course. I want to find someone, but it's not a subject of stress anymore. So he went to Harvard, possibly to help find a girl, but undoubtedly for his own fulfillment as well. Rivers wanted to quickly jump into a fourth and fifth album because he had nothing else going on. Weezer was his whole life, a name with which he identified better than his own. Every moment was spent in the studio, writing songs, chatting with fans, scheduling band affairs, and building his empire. But now, his priorities were shifting. Rivers was learning to be Rivers again. So, what did that mean for Weezer? The short months after Maladroit would prove to be as transformative for Rivers' music as they would be for Rivers himself. On New Year's Eve 2002, Cuomo attended a rave in downtown Los Angeles with the hopes of letting loose for the first time. Unsurprisingly, it was a bit of an uphill battle, and by the end of the night, he found himself at the venue's front curb writing on a napkin. 1. Everybody wants to sing. People like to dance, sure, and people like to rock, but everyone loves to feel the primal scream of song emanate from their chest, 
their lungs. Two, I have to lead these people. I have to remind them how to sing. Just then, hey, aren't you that guy from Weezer? <laughs> Say it ain't so, whoa, whoa. See, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Concluding that, a thousand keep fishins does not equal one Say it ain't so, whoa, whoa. That night, Rivers realized that a sequel to Maladroit with some extra fan recommendations and light durstisms would not be enough to usher Weezer into a bold new era. It wouldn't be long until Rick Rubin recommended meditation and Cuomo saw the light. In May of 2003, I went to my first Vipassana meditation course in the hopes that the technique would melt away the thought patterns that infused my creative process. The self-doubt, the self-criticism, the fear of trying new things, the craving for reliable formula. In many ways, 2003 would be a year of abandoning reliable formulas, though Rivers still found time to meet with Weezer and rehearse at various studios around LA, all the while bringing new songs like I Can Love and My Best Friend with a decisively lighter tone. These demos, along with a handful of favorites from 2002, were brought to Cello Studios in December of 2003 for the official start of Album 5's production. And after 17 days of careful recording, the band had nearly completed 19 album-worthy songs, some of which you might recognize. But after what was supposed to be a short break for the holidays, Weezer went AWOL. Personal issues, as was later reported, prevented the band from reuniting in January of 2004, leaving Rivers to pick through the pieces himself. Over time, though, as tends to happen when he's left to his own devices, Cuomo grew uncertain about the work done in 2003, eventually choosing to stage another fresh start tossing out all of the previous year's work just as he had with that of the year prior. It wouldn't be until July of 2004 that the rest of the band would arrive at Grandmaster Recorders for a second try, only to be met with The Plan. This time I am being vague. Rivers had 12 songs at the top of his list, 12 songs that he felt in the deepest pits of his gut would one day make up the entire track list of Weezer's fifth album, regardless of what anyone else thought. Though, he insisted that if the whole band set aside their differences and put everything they had into these 12 tracks and they didn't agree it was perfect, changes would be made. Progress. These songs were Average Person, Last Chance, Beverly Hills, This Is Such a Pity, Freak Me Out, I Am a Robot, They Are Stupid, Save Me, Losing My Mind, You Are the One, Out of Here, and Love Is the Answer. Once these songs seemed to be at a reasonably finished point on September 15th, Rivers dropped everything and flew out to Harvard leaving the remaining Weezers to finish some overdubs on the prize 12. For a while. As it turned out, although they had kept their promise of putting everything they had into Cuomo's favorite tracks, Pat, Brian, and Scott had their own favorites. And a lot more time had been booked at cello than what was needed for just some overdubs. So they recorded a few more. The Damage in Your Heart, We Are All on Drugs, Where to Start, and Peace. When Rivers returned in February of 2005, a full semester at Harvard later, he found that not only had his boys gotten a lot done without him, but his 12 heavenly ordained favorite tracks weren't sounding so perfect anymore. With the help of Rick Rubin, they looked through just about everything they'd recorded in the past year and tried to piece together something a bit more appealing. 23 tracks were completed in total, but only 12 made the final cut as the album's spring 2005 release date ate away at their time. Thankfully, Rick had quite a bit of industry clout, allowing them to work up until the last second on April 6, 2005. Of the 12 finalists, many would feature some of those more personal lyrics that Rivers had hyped up to the press and fans throughout the last few years. Like Pardon Me, inspired by the climactic ending of his first Vipassana retreat, and the friendships he'd recently mended. Peace, about fucking hating managing Weezer. Perfect Situation, about his bad habit of sabotaging his own life the other way, about feeling powerless to console his ex-girlfriend Jennifer Chiba after the death of her longtime boyfriend Elliot Smith. And Freak Me Out, about a spooky spider. Those songs are back to back, by the way. Every other song on the album has some interesting detail about it as well, as documented by an in-depth interview held by Weezer.com. Like how Hold Me was the first and only song that Rivers wrote while fasting. We Are All On Drugs was inspired by a dream Rivers had about a kid listening to loud music. Because music is a freaking drug, man, dopamine, man, f this is deep, man. And while My Best Friend was written in June of 2003 about a friend of Rivers, it was pitched to DreamWorks for use in Shrek 2, only to be denied because it was too obviously about Shrek. Which should tell you a lot about the company that Cuomo keeps. The biggest influence on the production of Make Believe would, in the frontman's own words, come from his meditation. Listen to Make Believe and compare it to the previous album, Maladroit. I know I can hear a difference in my singing. My voice just sounds much more sensitive and dynamic now. I also notice a difference in the lyrics. 
I'm much more open and communicative about my emotions now. I also notice a difference in the contributions from the other band members. I think my meditation has allowed me to be a better collaborator in the studio. I don't have so much fear that I won't get my way. I don't have so much anger if people have opposing opinions, and generally, I'm much more happy and comfortable in collaborative situations. So I think the guys finally got an opportunity to really shine on this album. But ultimately, I think the listeners should judge for themselves. The final tracks on Weezer's fifth album were Beverly Hills, Perfect Situation, This Is Such a Pity, Hold Me, Peace, We Are All on Drugs, I don't know why I said it like that. The Damage in Your Heart, Pardon Me, My Best Friend, The Other Way, Freak Me Out, and Haunt You Every Day. And with the release of the album came the release of its name. Rivers liked Either Way I'm Fine, as an homage to the phrase the now considerably more zen band leader often used during production. And Pat liked 1,000 Soviet children marching towards the sun, because it sounds cool as hell. But they met in the middle, with make-believe, for some reason. Released on May 10th, 2005, the 11th anniversary of the Blue Album, Make Believe was bolstered by quite a bit of sweet, sweet hype. The band scored their first, and to this day only, Rolling Stone cover story on the back of a two-year-long absence, a spiritual awakening, and a promise of personal lyrics. The same thing that had many fans and critics crossing their fingers for a third classic Weezer album. And yet, no. Weezer have been given a lot of breaks in their second era. Both the Green Album and Maladroit were cut miles of slack, despite consisting of a little more than slightly above average power pop. The obvious reason for this lenience has to do with the mean age of rock critics, and the fact that most of these mid-20s scribes were at their absolute peak for bias-forming melodrama when the Blue Album and Pinkerton were released. But now, there's an antidote for that nostalgic interference. Make Believe will expertly extract the last remaining good graces the critical community has to offer Latter-day Weezer. That sounds bad, huh? Well, it wasn't really. It shouldn't come as a shock that Pitchfork's 0.4 out of 10 was the lowest score given by any mainstream review of Make Believe, with most reviews falling in the mid to low range. Except for IGN, the game review website that chimed in with a 9.3 a higher score than they gave Assassin's Creed 2, Fallout New Vegas, Yakuza 0, Star Wars Battlefront 2, Civilization 5, Minecraft, and Imagine Party Babies. Scoff. That's the bias-forming melodrama speaking. <laughs> really, Pitchfork's review is more indicative of the fan response to Make Believe than the critical one. Although not River's favorite for the spot, Beverly Hills was chosen as the album's first single, by a vote to show you how far things had come, and it was a huge hit. Arguably, Weezer's biggest song ever, being the only track by the band to crack the top 10 on Billboard's Hot 100, a chart that monitors the most popular songs in the country of any genre, which most rock bands never get into. The single also helped make believe beat Maladroit's spot on the Billboard Top 200, with a debut position at number 2, pushing Weezer into an unprecedented third wave of mainstream success. You know, most aging 90s bands still kicking in the aughts would have killed to have half the sales they had a decade prior, but Weezer was the only one consistently topping their younger selves. At least commercially. While Beverly Hills may have helped secure the band another decade of relevance, and their first Grammy nomination, it came at a terrible cost. Remember the reason Rivers gave as to why he had to stop chatting with fans online? I'm gonna be rapping a lot more, by the way. I think that was one of the main causes of the falling out between me and my internet audience. Well, he shed some light on that in 2005. I kind of feel like that's what we did, in the approach of writing vocal parts that are much more lyric-oriented. I would just write out a bunch of words and start singing them without worrying about where the melody was going. It's much more about the rhythm of the words, and you can hear it on Beverly Hills. <laughs> that's right, gang. You may have never connected the dots before, but Beverly Hills was Weezer's first rap song. Oh my god! Yes! Yes! Finally! I feel like I'm gonna get a lot of duh comments, but personally, I never noticed. And while this may be exactly what I've always wanted, it was very clearly not what fans of Say It Ain't So and Falling For You wanted. To them, the Green Album and Maladroit were frustrating but forgivable detours, while Make Believe was a much more definitive and vile betrayal, leading to a major shift in how old-school Weezer fans saw the band from now on. 
which I find strange. As I explored earlier in the video, Rivers did make a real effort to write more personal lyrics, the main complaint fans had for Weezer's third and fourth album. And while it does boast a squeaky clean production that strays from the grime of Pinkerton and Maladroit, it still fits Cuomo's first ever public description of the album. A combo of green and pink, if that's possible. I can't deny that Make Believe is a much poppier product than green, and not nearly as angsty as Pinkerton. But at this point, would that have really been more authentic? Rivers shed his angst, very intentionally. He made amends with people he treated poorly, sold his mansion, kept his pants on, gave time to charity, and overall became a much healthier and happier person. Was that a mistake? No. No. It was not. But, I don't know, maybe Make Believe should have been two albums. A toxic Pinkerton sequel in 2003, in the same vein as Maladroit, and a fresh start in 2005. Instead, we sort of got the Frankenstein. An album that tries to do both. And while I pretty definitively tried to argue that it failed in 2022, yeah, I went the whole video not mentioning that I've done this before. Brian didn't write Freak Me Out, by the way, but I have changed my ways. I try to be more open-minded these days, and I think Make Believe succeeds as its own thing. Because, as much as it very obviously serves as the end of the second Weezer era of mindless awesome pop rock, it starts another equally interesting and arguably pretty cool era. Weezer. Modern Rock's Weird Dads. Speaking of... When Weezer finished their make-believe tour in December of 2005 with not a single planned performance or studio date in the following year, rumors started to circulate that a breakup was coming. Pat got back into his old side project, The Special Goodness, Brian formed the relationship, Scott was called back to his home planet, and Rivers, the once megalomaniacal rock star with plans to conquer the world, returned to Harvard, telling the press, I want to go to school, and after that, I want to get married and have a family. It doesn't seem like being on the road or working with a band is going to allow that to happen. But if there's one lesson that Cuomo had to learn throughout this story, it was balance. Hell, it was something he'd struggled with since the band formed. He gave Matt Sharp an ultimatum all the way back in 1992 to get Weezer a record deal or he'd quit the band to attend UC Berkeley. Then he cut contact with everyone when things got too big and moved across the country. Then he cut contact again when Pinkerton was too small to try and perfect pop music. Then when he thought he did it, he sacrificed his own decency just to try and push Weezer to new heights. He'd hurt himself and others countless times just because he couldn't do anything in moderation. But now... He was communicating, meditating, levitating. Hell, he was engaged. Yeah, it's the cutest thing. Just three days after the last show on the Make Believe Tour, Rivers was in Tokyo with a girl he'd met all the way back in 1997. She was going to college in Boston when Rivers was doing some solo shows in the area and they hit it off. But then came, you know, until 2005 when he got to thinking and called her. She was living in Japan. He flew out and proposed. They got married in 2006 and Weezer would reunite in 2008 never really leaving the public eye. A feat they couldn't have achieved if not for River's commitment to balance. In 2011, Mikey Welsh would share an interesting story on Facebook. Not noticed by most people in the crowd for many reasons, on July 29th, he joined Weezer on stage for the last time. It was really Pat's idea to have me play the sweater song, I was told it would be the last song of the night, with both hands playing it at once. We, Pat, Brian, and myself were having a great time goofing around backstage. Weezer and the Lips went out together for one tune. Suddenly, one of the techs walked up and strapped one of Pat's guitars on me. The next thing I knew, I was out on stage in front of a sea of people singing along with Rivers' a song about a sweater. All I really remember was trading smiles with Scott and Wayne from the Lips, shooting a shitload of confetti everywhere. And the rest, well... Let's just say it was a great night. It's heavy for me. We went through a lot of crazy stuff together. I really love those guys. You may have noticed an unlikely face in River's wedding photos. Among the current members of Weezer and longtime friends stood Matt Sharp, the band's first bassist who quit mysteriously in the late 90s and sued them in the early 2000s. I was actually gonna dedicate a decent chunk of this video to that story, but it was cut to maintain a proper flow. However, if you are interested in hearing how Matt and Rivers made amends after a messy lawsuit, then you can watch it as a standalone video on Nebula. 
Nebula is an independent creator-owned streaming service that emboldens me and countless others to tell our stories our way, all without any ads or sponsors weighing us down. The platform has a huge catalog of original content, like Lindsay Ellis's Nebula-exclusive Ballad of John and Yoko, which dives deep into the unintended consequences of the death of John Lennon. It's a beautiful video exploring one of the strangest stories in modern music history. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Some of my favorite creators have been uploading original and exclusive videos to Nebula for years now, and I bet some of yours have been too, especially on the music side of things, with the likes of Polyphonic, Mary Spender, Twelve Tone, Middle Eight, Todd in the Shadows, and recently Mike the Snare, all calling Nebula home. So, if you want to support more jumbo-sized projects like this one, enjoy the exclusive Matt Sharp v. Weezer video, and watch the work of countless talented creators, then go to nebula.tv slash markbutevil to get 40% off. Because with my code, Nebula is just $36 a year. And for those of you looking to share the love, Nebula has got you covered with new annual gift cards. Use the link gift.nebula.tv slash markbutevil to give a year of Nebula to a friend, or just nebula.tv slash markbutevil to get a year yourself for just 36 bucks. Three bucks a month. I'd like to give a special thanks to these wonderful sources and to you for watching till the end. Since it's almost definitely just the diehards hearing this, I'd like to break the fourth wall a little and add, Oh my god, this video is way too long! I initially planned on releasing a way bigger project at the end of the year, but I trimmed it down to this, thinking it would be a walk in the park. And I was wrong. So genuinely, thank you for watching what I hope will be a very rarely repeated experiment. Be sure to check out the rest of my channel, like if you liked it, subscribe if you want more. I'm gonna leave now. Goodbye!